So we're in a series on friendship and uh, really putting forth that friendship is an art. It's not a science. Uh, it, is, it is an art. And there's an art to making friends and there's an art to keeping friends. Now, before we go into this text, here's what I want to ask. How many of you guys or women are the ones that are the primary person to mow your yard? How many of you are the primary person that mows the yard? Now, some of you are really proud of that and you're like, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I do. Me, we're supposed to mow? I didn't even know we we're supposed to do that. You know, it's like a jungle out there. Uh, so, so a couple years ago, I bought a, a lawnmower, and it was nice and all, and I, I mowed. And I, I, I was like one of those guys that didn't read the instruction manual. And, and the next season, I started it up and had gas in it and started through it. And I like, died. And it wouldn't start up no matter what I did. And you know what, what I forgot to put in? Come on. Oil. Everyone knows that you're supposed to put oil into a lawnmower, but I didn't. And so the other, the other night, I'm, o- I'm over at Heather's mom's house and, and, and I'm mowing her yard with the, with the tractor that's there. And, and, and then all of a sudden, I just started to see this light come on. It's like low in oil. I'm like, oh no, because I had to replace that mower a couple years ago. I don't want to have to replace this one because um, I can't afford to. And, and so I was like, please, 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 let's get this back so I can get oil in it at work. And everything is really good. And as I was thinking about um, oil, Oil and and uh, engines and mowing the yard. I was like, oil is to the mower what trust is to our relationships. Oil is to the mower what trust is to our relationships. If we don't have trust, relationships don't grow. And if we don't have trust, uh, they're not only are they not going to grow, they're not going to go anywhere uh, together. And so uh, if you have a bulletin, this will be the best way for you to follow along as we go through this uh, tonight for the next uh, 30, 35 minutes. Here we go. Friendship sacrificially seeks the highest good. Friendship sacrificially seeks the highest good of another by building trust through intentionality, investment, and encouragement over a significant amount of time together. Did you get that? What, what, what is Friendship. Friendship, by definition, requires sacrifice. It requires trust. It requires investment. And it requires intentionality. It requires encouragement over a significant amount of time. And here's, I brought this up a few weeks ago, and I'm more and more convinced that we within the Northeast of the United States, but maybe particular in Western Pennsylvania, are very much about looking at friendships from the rear view mirror looking back and saying, oh, I really miss my good friend back. And then it's some time uh, in the past. It could have been a childhood friend. Maybe as teenagers, you probably got into too much trouble during that time. I don't know. Could have been a college roommate or a college relationship that you had there. It could have been, hey, when we first got married, man, our, our neighbors, they were awesome. And I so miss that friendship. Or you might have moved into the area like several of you in the room here. And you're not from here. And you're like, I miss the friends of the past. And what Paul is doing within these, these passages of Scripture, Romans 13, 14, and 15, he's given instructions on how Christian ought to live, how we should respect the government, the authorities that are over us, whether we like them or not. But also, as we get closer into proximity with one another, how do we get along? Not only how do we get along, how do we be the type of friends that are going to endure together so that our friendship isn't looking back and saying, I remember when and how great that was, but we look at the present and saying, who has God put around me today to be this type of a friend? And what type of friendship should I be looking for into the future? And if you don't have trust, it's not going to go. And if you're not willing to sacrifice and invest, you're going to have troubles along the way. The gospel advances through friendships. That's how God created us. The gospel advances through that. It's not by standing on a street corner and yelling at people to go to hell, although that can work. Typically, it doesn't work. God has put friendship in our life for a reason. And this series breaks apart friendship, casual, close, committed, and covenant relationship. Just to review where we've been Casual friendships are about investment when opportunity arises to connect. Casual friendships is is all about investing when opportunity arises to connect. It was a few weeks ago we talked about that. The last week we talked about close friendships. 
Peace as proximity intensifies. If you really want to know the difference between close friends and committed friends, close friends is what the Bible talks about with phileo love, like a brotherly type of love. Our, our brotherhood, our sisterhood, one with another. And so it's brotherly love. I'm, I'm going to be somewhat vulnerable with you. I'm going to be somewhat close to you. We're going to figure out how we're going to get, uh, get along whenever we're in each other's company. But it might not go a lot further than maybe whenever we rub shoulders once a week with each other or more. But I'm thinking from the text of Scripture and through life experience that committed friendships are what we really long for. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Unconditional endurance is what is required for um, committed relationships. And that's more agape, sacrificial love. Agape, sacrificial love. It's all about sacrificing for another. Not necessarily so that I can get something from you. It's more so about I'm just going to give and give and give. And over time, our relationship is going to grow. Some characteristics before we go into the text. Characteristics of committed friends. A commitment of quality time together. I'm, I'm going to spend quality time together. Let me, let me just say this. Listen, if you're starting into dating someone, you singles that are out there, if you're dating someone and your, your idea of a good date is going to the movies or playing video games, okay, not a good a date. Not, just not, okay? For multiple reasons, I'm just going to keep it PG. Not, not a good idea uh, to, for that. That's not going to be quality time together. Guys like side-by-side -side time, that's bro time. Okay? Uh, guys, if, if you're in that dating phase of relationships, or even if you're married and you're like, I'm just not connecting with my wife, um, that's because they like face-to-face -face time. And that means, oh, you mean I got to talk? That's typically what that requires. Okay? Uh, that, that typically is like sitting across the table from one another. I want to be with you. I want to hear you. I want to get, but you're like, but what if I don't really want to get to know? Listen, you're in covenant. You need to, okay? You need to spend that time face to face with one another. So it's commitment to quality time. Committed friends, by the way, actually like being together. It's not burdensome to be together. Although there's burdensome seasons of time, it's not that. Mutual values and life goals. We, we have like-minded values, like-minded life goals. We're going the same direction. There's a freedom to help correct character flaws. There's a freedom to help correct character flaws. Listen, if there's not trust, that freedom isn't there. If there's trust, then that freedom is there. Okay, let me, let me just tell you this story. I'm, I'm convinced for us to grow from casual to close to committed friends. I'm con convinced of the ABCs. The ABCs. Here we go. A, everybody wants to feel like they're accepted. Everybody. Friendship at its basic core is, is about magnetism. I want to be around people that make me feel like I'm accepted. And so, so the gospel for it to advance, then, then there has to be acceptance. People have to feel like they're really, really welcome. So if you walk in, just example, you walk into the back of the room here into the sanctuary and someone is sitting by themselves. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you walk up. Oh, but they're on their phone. No, 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 no. You go up and you talk to them. You mean I have to get out of my comfort zone? Yes, 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 you do. Because they need to feel like they're accepted. They need to feel like they're welcome. That's A. B goes to belonging. If you're going to go from close to committed, they have to feel like they belong. How am I contributing into this group? What is my place here? If you're in a committed group, uh, in a community group, or uh, in some sort of a small group environment, uh, there has to be a feeling of, I belong here. Not only am I welcome, but I actually belong. If someone feels like they're accepted and they belong, they're willing to be challenged. And so, so here's the thing. If there's a freedom to help with character flaws, man, you better feel like you're accepted and that you belong, and the other person better feel like they're accepted and belong as well. Okay? Next, uh, there's personal involvement in defending reputation. If I'm in a committed friendship with someone and they are somewhere around a group of people and my name comes up, there is zero doubt that they're going to defend me. Not because I'm perfect, because I'm not but because we have that type of relationship to say, oh, you just don't understand. Uh, this is what's really going on or whatever. There's a risk of transparency and there's mutual commitment of sacrificial love. I'm mutually sacrificing. I'm, I'm out to out honor you. Now these are, so these are some basic characteristics of committed friendships. That's what they are. Now, 
if you just, if you drew circles on the page, lots of, uh, there's a big circle for casual friends. Uh, we're just acquaintances. And then um, within, within the church, there should be a pretty big circle when it comes to close friends. But very few people will ever get to committed friendships. Very few people. And yet, that's what scripture's calling us to endure. Sacrificial love and action, one with another. So Romans 15, one to three, here we go. Now, we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. That's a direct quote from Psalm 69. Okay, and so this idea is, is twofold. Based on Romans 15, committed friends will bear the weaknesses of others. Committed friends will bear the weaknesses of others. I'm going to see your flaws. I'm going to acknowledge your weaknesses, and yet I'm not going to stay away from you just because they're there. Now, here's the thing. Likewise, they are seeing your or our weaknesses, and they are staying connected too. That's what the gospel does. But not only is there a bearing of witness uh, of weaknesses one with another, but there's a denial of themselves by refocusing pleasures. There's a denial of yourself, uh, refocusing pleasures, not on yourself, but to others. Here's what I hear all the time from people. Almost every single week, I hear this from somebody. It could be you. Um, if you're like, oh, you're talking only about me. No, I've heard it more than one. Actually, most people I've heard this type of a thing before. Man, I wish friendships were just more convenient. I just wish when I was around people it was more comfortable or this one. I really wish that friendships were more life-giving. I just, I just want to be around people that give me more life. Um, what? Now, let me, let, me, let me just unpack this a little bit. If it's all about comfort and it's all about convenience, it's all around people that give life to us, then we're only going to be around perfect people who never go through a difficult time and always have the right thing to say. Now, how many of you would just say, hey, I'm that person? Exactly. Absolutely none of us are perfect people who always have the right things to say. Relationships are hard. They're not always convenient. They're not always comfortable. There are seasons with that, but we can't look at relationships and say, what's in it for me? Based on these first three verses, he's saying, listen, we're going to bear with one another. We're going to forgive one another. We're going to uh, look on how to make another person feel good or welcomed or accepted or giving them belonging by focusing on their good, not our own. But let's keep on going. Verse four, for whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction. Look at this. So that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from scripture. Through these 13 verses, it's about four times that we see the two words, so that. This, then. This happens, then that will happen. This is what's going on here in the text. So look at this. So that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures. So what's the point of verse four? Not only are we are to bear one another's weaknesses and deny ourselves by refocusing pleasures on another, but we're to find biblical hope for endurance and encouragement. And here's the thing that we do. We're so impatient when it comes to relationships. I'm not sure that these are my people. I'm not sure that she gets me. I don't know that he understands me. Oh man, did you see the look that they just gave across the room? I mean, goodness gracious. And because that look happened or because that, I don't know, I think I'm just gonna have to go find my people because they probably aren't my people, but over there, they may be the people that I want in relationship. And, and, and what we, real, we don't realize is that we need endurance and encouragement, not from, uh, we, we, not from the people around us, but from scripture. That's what we need. We need to be focusing in on scripture. We need to be focusing on what were the examples that we have in scripture from Christ himself? What were the examples that we have from David's relationship with Jonathan? What was that relationship back in the time of, of Jonathan's dad being king? Jonathan's dad, Saul, was king. And he reigned and he ruled, but he did not obey God. 
And so God promised that there was going to be another king that was going to step up, and that king was going to be David, and Saul hated it. And what did Saul try to do? He tried to kill him, and Jonathan was there defending David at almost every single turn. Yeah, my dad's trying to kill you. I, I know. I'm sorry. Hey, my dad's coming before you. Um, you need to go hide. Oh, I'm so committed. There was this deep affection one for another. Why are we as a church so committed to the Bible? Because there is where we will find endurance and encouragement. And it is required, required for us to have the type of relationships that scripture longs for us to have. And deep down that we long to have ourselves. Look at verse five and six. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement, how is he given it? Through scripture. Grant you to live in harmony one with another. According to Christ Jesus, the ultimate example, so that, there you go again, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Have you heard that before? That the church is supposed to be brothers and sisters who are so unified in Christ that they come across as being as one. Yes, we might have differences. We might have different convictions on secondary or opinionated things like we talked about last week. And yet there's still one mind and one voice when it comes to the main things. We're called to live in harmony. When Jesus was with his disciples, he prayed and said to his father, oh, that they may be one as you and I are one. He's talking about the relationship that he as the son has with God the father. Think about how important that is. But also think about how much we fall short of that. One stare the wrong way. One phrase or comment that comes out of someone's mouth. And we instantly jump on, on judging or instantly jump on, man, what is wrong with her? What is wrong with him? And yet Paul is saying here, endure. But endure because scripture is calling you to it and because Christ is the example of it. Our takeaway from verse six, live in harmony with one mind and one voice. Live in harmony with one mind and one voice. Now keep on going beyond verse six. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted you to the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcised. In context, this is the Jews. Christ became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises to the Father and so that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, may glorify God for his mercy. Now, in context, this is, this is uh, so mind-boggling. Why on earth would the Jewish people who are now Christians welcome in the Gentiles who are not circumcised? Because of the gospel. Because this gospel is advancing through relationships. And if Jews and Gentiles can get along, surely this is going to be a witness of love to the outside unbelieving world. And this is what's happening. And so in our text here, he says, um, so that these promises of the father would be confirmed among the outsiders out there. And then he goes into a few references as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and I will sing praise to your name. Again, it says rejoice you Gentiles with with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all people praise him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will appear. That's Jesus Christ. The root of Jesus, or the root of Jesse will appear. The one who rises to rule the Gentiles, the Gentiles will hope in him. This is scandalous. At the time that, that Paul is writing this to the Roman church, how on earth is this good news that was for God's chosen people going to the outsiders out there? How is that message going to be carried? How are people going to see it? How are people going to understand it? And with their mind, it's not a science, but it is everything having to do with the gospel. If we look at friendships apart from the gospel, we miss what friendships are about and we miss what the gospel is about. Because our relationships, our interaction with one another should be mind boggling. What would draw a people like us into one room together? Only the Holy Spirit of God who brings dead people to life. We were dead in our sin and trespasses. And yet by the mercy of God, he brought us to life out of darkness and into his light. And as he does this, then we have an obligation and a privilege to welcome people in. 
they feel accepted, give them belonging and challenge them to grow in the faith as we also are growing in the faith alike. See, here's the thing about the church and every church that I've ever been a part of or read about struggles with it. We are to duly focus on the gospel advancing among both outsiders and insiders. Committed friends have a dual focus of reaching people with the gospel and helping people grow in the gospel. The gospel is the starting line of our faith, but it's also the race that we're running of our faith. And we have a dual focus that we're called to. It can't be just about us and our safe huddles, nor is it only about reaching people out there. It's a both and dual focus. And this is what Paul is bringing up to the Roman church. And then verse 13 is so powerful, this benediction of this text. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe. So that, do you see it again? So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's, here's what I know. Here's what I know. Real life. In the last hour, in the last hour, there's something deep within us that has longed for greater joy and greater peace. In the last day, we've been around people, maybe within our own home, who profess faith in Jesus Christ, and it's like, oh, if this is hope and peace, I'm not sure that I want that. Could have been on the car ride here. If you're anything uh, like, like the average car ride to a church gathering, it's chaos. And then the car shuts off in the parking lot, and then someone says, hey, how are you? And you're like, oh, good. But here's the reality of it. We're called to endure through those difficult times. We're called to press on when life seems like it's chaotic. And here's the thing, the enemy that is out there who's, who is waging war against our souls does not want us to have these type of relationships one with another. He does not want us to endure. He does not want us to experience peace. He does not want us to experience joy. He has put it out there as this counterfeit gospel that says, be busier, achieve more, get more accolades, get more money, because there's where you will find Peace and joy because behind the white picket fence, everything is bliss in that home. And the reality is, is that's not the gospel that is portrayed in the scriptures at all. The enemy wants us to be busy out of control so that chaos overwhelms us so that we never have time for the type of relationships where the gospel will actually advance. And yet that's the very thing that we need and at the very core of what we long for. That's what we're called to. In this verse here, I love it. As you believe, as you put into action these things that are here among yourselves, joy and peace you will experience and you will overflow with hope by the power of the Spirit. Put faith in action. This is what we are called to do as we rely on the Spirit's power. This is what committed friends do. Faith goes into action as we rely on the Spirit's power. And you're like, well, this sounds good. I mean, it sounds like a church moment. I mean, this is great that Paul's writing this almost 2,000 years ago, but, but so what? I mean, I, I get it. I mean, I like brotherly love, but if I'm going to go to sacrificial love, committed friendship type of love, man, I, I don't know if I have time for that, and I don't know that I need it. Well, up on the screen are, are, are some characteristics. Here, here's, here's some, not characteristics, but some de descriptors of committed friends. Committed friends are unified. They might not always agree, but they're unified. Committed friends are generous. They're honest. They're sacrificial one with another. They're encouraging. They're trustworthy. They're compassionate. They're forgiving. They're vulnerable. They're present. Hey, do you need any help with that? Oh, no, we're good. And you look over at your spouse and like, do you think they need help with that? Yeah, they need help with that. Yeah, we're going over. Committed friends are present. Even whenever the other person says, oh, it's no, it's, it's no problem. You don't need to come. Committed friends come anyways. Well, if they want us to come, why don't they just say so? There's a million reasons why, and, there, and there's a long time that we don't have to talk about that. They want you to know what they're thinking and what they're feeling without them ever having to say it. And when you know them, you will go and do the things that are actually sacrificial. Now, out of those 11 things, we had the 12th one on, committed friends are necessary. Now, I want you to just reflect on this. I want you to reflect on just this list here. How many of you could look at this list of these 12 attributes of committed friends and say, yep, 
I have about five of those type of people in my life. Now think about it. Present day. Not five years ago. Not a year ago. Not 20 years ago. Today. Right now. Active in your life. You have five? If I was a betting person, I think that the average man in this room, if they're lucky, has one. One. And if I'm really honest, I think most men in this room have zero. I'm not even going to venture into the women part of it because the men will take that and the women will be like, man, you're so wrong. I'm not even guessing about the women. But I know as guys, we long for this. How does this work? What, is it, what does it look like for us to have this? For us to have relationships that are unified, generous, honest, sacrificial, encouraging, trustworthy, compassionate, forgiving, vulnerable, present, loyal, and necessary. Here's the thing. We have to invest in each other's lives. And it's not when it's convenient because that's casual friendship. It's not just when we're in proximity with one another because that's close friendships. Committed friends spend quality time together because they know that they need it. Most men battle different sins totally in private and shame has locked them into isolation. And yet the gospel sets us free from that shame and from that isolation. But the gospel advances through relationship. We have to have people in our lives who are willing to get deep into the trenches and say, listen, it's okay for you to tell me what you're struggling with because I'm going to be just as open with you. I'm struggling with the same types of things. How can we be there for one another? And we're longing for it. In a study of, um, uh, of friendships and relationships, as people get older, something clicks when people get into their late 60s and early 70s. And the, the sphere of their friendships gets smaller. In their 60s and 70s, this, the, the number of friends gets smaller, not because the friends are dying off, but there's something that happens in, the late, in their late 60s where they select who they want to do life with and they just do it. These are the people that I'm going to see on a regular basis because they realize, hey, life is too short. I'm going to invest in these people as they invest in me. And guess what? I got nothing to prove. I just know that I'm, I'm longing for someone to be there in my life. Studies are showing this time and time again. They deselect the friendships out that don't really mean too much. And they select at a heavy level those who they're going to invest in. And here's my question to you. That's secular research. research. Why doesn't the church say, hey, I need that now. I might be 29 years old, and yet I know that I need it, so I'm willing to do it. Now, some of you are like, 29? That'd be awesome to be 29 again. Okay, fill in the number of wherever you are. We need it. Now let's take the context of scripture and let's quickly look at what it looks like for our context here because I'm going to give you just a little blueprint of how this would work in our own lives modern day. How to be a committed friend. Commit to unconditionally endure. Just commit. I've made a choice. The stake is in the ground. I will unconditionally endure with you. There is nothing that you will say that will drive me away. There's nothing that I'm going to say to you that's going to drive you away. Why? Because the gospel secures us in this relationship. So we need to exercise faith that the gospel actually does secure us. But scripture says it does. So we're going to commit to unconditionally endure together. We, we make a choice, a decision. And then number two, be known as you seek to fully know others. Now, the, the art of this is keeping this in balance. As I am vulnerable about myself, I'm also listening really well for the people who are vulnerable with me. And I'm going to make it a safe place for them to tell me anything that they want to tell me. And in that safe place, there is some, something powerful as I am being vulnerable with people to say to them, listen, um, you can trust me. I'm not going to judge you. And whatever we talk about right now isn't going to go to anyone else. No one. Do you know that the people on staff at the church and people that serve as interns or residents or people who are elders within the church and, 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 and in leadership capacity, we sign a confidentiality form. And if that confidentiality is broken, the person is fired or they're removed from that role. Why? Because we need trust. 
And we need it to be at the highest level where, hey, listen, you can tell me anything and it's not gonna go anywhere else. Now, should there be grace in that? Of course. Should we work it out if, if that's broken? Of course we should. But we need confidentiality to be so high so that, and we're going to get here in a second in, in verse 3, so high that we expect many difficult conversations to happen face to face, not with other people. Right here, this number three is the key for us to go deeper into the relationships. If someone comes to me and says, I'm having a problem with this person, what do you think I'm going to say? Go talk to the other person. Why do I need to hear it? See, we, we find safety in talking to other people about the difficulties that they're having. That, okay, how do I say this? I find safety in talking to Bill. I don't, okay? But just imagine. I find safety, not because of you, okay? But I, I, I find safety in talking to Bill about someone else when I should just go and talk to that other person. Because we're, to, to, we're to, to speak the truth to one another in love, not to get a cheering section on the side of the people that see it our way. It's easier to talk to someone on the side, but it's biblical to talk to the person face to face. There are, if we just had tons of time, I would just sit on this point forever. There are hundreds of conversations that need to happen within every single Christian fellowship around the world where we need to have the courage to say face to face the things that we feel very comfortable saying to someone else. And this requires endurance and the gospel being the glue that holds us together. But even right now, if I just said, what's the conversation that you need to have that you're too, I'll just say it too much of a wimp to have the conversation, but you know, the need that need that conversation needs to happen. Can you think of the conversation even at this moment? Yeah. We got to have the courage to have difficult conversations. And in that difficult conversation, it's not just one conversation. It's typically about three. The first conversation is the shock and awe of like, did that really just come out of my mouth? And the other person saying, did I really just hear what I just heard? And then there's that little bit of awkwardness. And then there's coming back around and just saying, hey, I know that that was really hard, but can, can we continue that conversation? Because we need to. And then after you come around to continue that conversation, the third conversation is really simple. It's like, are we cool? Yeah, it's great. Every committed friendship is willing to have mutual difficult conversations one with another. Every single one of them. And most of us don't get there because we're not willing to have those conversations and say the love of Christ keeps us together. Number four, be honest about your feelings. Oh, this is so hard. I'm not saying that, that committed friends are, 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 are uh, you know, to be all feelings and no truth, but it's okay to say, listen, when you said that, or when you looked at me that way, or whenever you use that tone, that hurt. And, and I'm trying to understand you. I'm trying to get to know you. I'm trying to go deeper with you, but I just need to be honest. Like sometimes the way you look at me, the way you talk to me, it stings a lot. And I just want, I don't want this to be a wedge between us. Can we just have this conversation? We're going to endure together. Number five, committed friends spur one another on. They just do. Keep on running, keep on running, keep on running. Do you know that the gathering together of uh, people throughout scripture, uh, it, when referenced in, in Hebrews, don't give up on meeting together, that idea of spurring one another on literally means nag, nag one another on. Keep on going, keep on going, keep on running, keep on doing it. You can do it. Um, I was with someone in the church the other day at the gym and, uh, and they, they said, I have a goal. I want to, I want to lose 20 pounds before the end of the year. And I'm like, oh man, I, I love goals like that. Here's what you have to do. And, and the person is going, I'm not going to use names. Okay. But the person's going for 20 minutes and not one bead of sweat is coming down their face. I'm like, this is not going to happen unless you keep on going. And they're like, I got to go because I'm, I'm meeting someone and we're going to have pancakes together. I'm like, why did you even get out of bed and come to the gym? Because if you're going to go eat pancakes and you're not even sweating, you're not going to lose anything. And they're like, oh, that's so like, whatever. Now, I know the person well enough, except to belonging, they feel challenged. It's fine. Okay. But here, here's the thing in that conversation. It was a nagging on to say, keep on running, keep on going. And they upped it. And within five minutes, they're sweating their tail off. 
And yet it's like, yeah, that's what it is right there. That's what it is. As, as Christians who are committed in our friendships one with another, we nag one another on. We spur one another on. Keep on running. Keep on going. Number six, be quick to fully forgive. Be quick to fully forgive. How many times do we forgive one another? Jesus said 70 times seven. Over and over and over and over again. Why? Because I'm sinful, you're sinful. We keep on fighting. We keep on going. But I'm going to forgive you along the way. I'm going to say things. I'm going to do things that are going to need an apology. And I'm sorry. And then finally, pray detailed prayers for and with one another. Pray detailed prayers for and with one another. How many people in your life do you regularly meet with and pray detailed and specific prayers one with another? And when you're not in each other's company, you're praying for them. Committed friends do that and they do it often. Do you believe that there's a need for us to have committed friends? Scripture does. And if we want to see the gospel advance in ways that is compelling to the world around us, then they need to see love that doesn't make sense by any sort of logic. And they need to see that love that is sacrificial and in action one for another. See, we have to be close friends around this room. We're going to have people that are, that are going to be casual friends, but that needs to move into close friendships, so that we need to have sensitivity one with another, learn each other's convictions, learn each other's likes and dislikes, learn each other's past, learn where people are coming from. I have this, I'm, 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 I'll just say it real quick. I have this grid kind of in my mind. And this might actually be on there. Go ahead and enable that, that slide. That's, this is kind of this grid that goes through my mind as I'm meeting someone for the, the first time. And, and the grid kind of looks like this. There's, there's this background up on top. As I get to know someone, I want to know their background. I want to hear their story. I, I want to hear what's going on from their past. What was their home like? What, what was it like when they were growing up? What, what did they excel at? What did they like going on? But then um, that flows into that middle part. But I also have on the side, hey, what's your career? What do you do during the day? What does this look like during, what's your life in, in the business world or whatever you're doing? But on the same time, there's also a home part of your life that's coming into it. And so you have passes coming into the center. You have your work that's coming into the center. You have your home life and socialization that's coming in the center. And as we are community one with another, then the gospel is transformative. And as the gospel is transformative, transformative, then what is produced is spiritual growth and discipleship. This grid is not meant to be scientific. It's just meant to be some sort of reminder. Do I know, I'll just keep on picking on it. Do I know Bill well enough in his, in his past to understand why he ticks the way he is? Do I understand his work life to, to know why his availability or lack of, vulner, uh, of lack of ability is there? Do I know what is keeping him busy with his kid's schedule and stuff like that? And then as I come, as we see this in our, our friendship, then the gospel starts to go and it produces a more sanctified him and a more sanctified him of me as he hears my story and as he understands my circumstances. Make sense? just a helpful grid for us to look at together. Let's pray. And, uh, and then let's worship. And, and we're going to celebrate communion again, uh, like we did last uh, week together. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for the joy that's ours because of the spirit of God at work. God, I thank you that, that through relationships that we grow, but we have to have the determination and the conviction to have difficult conversations, regardless of what uh, might seem to be preventing us from having those conversations. Um, we, need, we need to have those. And so God, would you, by your grace and according to the, the power of the Spirit, would you enable us to have difficult conversations one with another so that our friendships would be more committed and more transformative knowing that we're going to faithfully endure together and that our relationship is going to be mutually sacrificial. Father, I thank you for the cross of Christ. And I thank you that because of the cross of Christ, that we don't have to live in isolation, that you are the lifter of our heads. You're the one who says that there is no more shame and there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ. And you speak that through one another through your people. So we thank you for that. I ask, Lord, that we would be a church that is committed to your word 
and a church that is committed to speaking your word in such a way that is encouraging and spurs one another on for each other's greater good. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.